Ah, the grand county of the Mootland, often shortened to just the Mootland, and simply referred to as the Moot by its inhabitants, is a very strange land within the Empire. It is blessed with very fertile soil and a surprisingly peaceful ambient, in contrast to the rest of the Empire and the wider Old World. The people that live there aren't human, albeit they are officially recognized as Imperial citizens, and they have managed to make a fortune out of a situation born out of the butt of a joke, as it often is with these halflings. The Mootland? Never heard of the place. It's part of the Empire? Really? A place with halflings in charge? Well, whose stupid idea was that then? Halflings are a race of humanoids about half the size of a full-grown man. Although somewhat similar in anatomy to the race of the dwarfs, it is believed by scholars that the halflings are more akin to mankind, and the Mountain Kings speak of how they first believed them to be the beardless humans. Indeed, everywhere men have set foot and created civilization, the halflings weren't far behind often thoroughly integrated into the human majority. Human scholars have two main theories about the birth of this particular race. The first theory is that Verena, the human goddess of knowledge and justice, mother of Myrmidia and Shalea, and bride of Moor, created the halflings as a bid to make a race of man that was immune or at least resistant to the taint of chaos. For indeed, the small folk are known to be particularly difficult to be won over to the side of the great enemy. The other theory is that Ranald, the human god of luck and all of those who seek to deceive, created the halflings as some kind of divine cosmic joke. This theory is rarely taken seriously, but it does somewhat represent the way some humans interact with halflings, making unending jokes about them. Regardless of what others may say, the halflings themselves simply know that they exist, and couldn't even fathom why the big folk, as they call humans, would bother so much as to how or why they were created. Rural and earthy to a fault, halflings prefer the hoe to the sword, albeit the former can also serve as a weapon in a pinch. Indeed, they would rather smoke, drink, cook, and, if you ask any human, steal the odd jewellery here and there, than make war with others. However, you would doom yourself should you underestimate the bravery and tenacity of such people. Indeed, as part of the war effort of the wider empire, the current elder of the moot, which is their own way of calling their elector count, his me Stoutheart, has sent regiments of scouts and skirmishers to the Imperial Army. A couple of these halflings have been mentioned by their commanders for bravery and resourcefulness, albeit they are often accompanied by complaints from the quartermasters, or theft of food rations from supply wagons, and other shenanigans. But even so, the idea of a halfling warrior is the butt of many a joke throughout the Empire, the Southern Kingdoms, and even Bretonia. As a hint towards their brave side, the halflings worship the warrior god Sigma above all other gods of the Empire, calling him their protector. The funny thing is, Nowhere in his many sagas has Sigma ever mentioned the halflings, much less saved them from anything. That being said, they do have their own deities, much unknown outside of the moot, for seldom do strangers take profound interest in their strange deities. The halflings worship those gods much more casually than other races worship their own deities, but these are important to them nonetheless. Esmeralda is the goddess of home and hearth, to whom the festival known as Pie Week is devoted to. Oh, my sister Emelda is the one you're looking for. She makes the best honey pumpkin pie in the Mootland. Stay for a few more days and you will be able to taste it for yourself. 
Phineas is the patron god of tobacco, and it is said that his pout of the grass is endlessly full. Indeed, tobacco is something almost sacred to these halflings. Josias the farmer, the god who always knows what the weather holds, and can coax life out of the most barren of soils. Hyacinth is the goddess of fertility, birth, and the art of intimate contact. The former worries any witch hunter who comes to know about such a divine being for its blatant, albeit very weak, connections to Slanesh, or she who thirsts, depending on who one asks. The main reason why strangers do not often visit the moot is because to a halfling there is no such thing as theft, only borrowing without asking. The reason for this is because the little folk live amongst their extended families their whole lives, made up of parents, uncles, and many, many cousins, to the point that there is a specifically halfling slang. Cousin by way of marriage? who describes someone who is truthfully from the family, but is unclear why or how, and surely they'd let you borrow it. Or at least, that is how they think. Halflings also feel at home in conversations that would make a grizzled Marienburg soldier think twice about joining in, describing with absolutely zero details left out what their great uncle and aunt did on their wedding night, and why that is positively hilarious to them. Even so, strangers are very welcome in the moot, as long as they bring coin and gossip, preferably both. There is, however, one stereotype the halflings are known for that makes it so that they are always welcome in taverns, inns, and even the royal kitchens of barons, dukes, counts, kings, and even emperors. They can make a delicious meal out of almost anything. The land of the Moot is particularly blessed in many ways. Sufficient rainfall waters the land to guarantee regular and good crops throughout the Moot. It was created from the lands that were previously part of the provinces of Avaland and Stirland by Emperor Ludwig II, the Vat in the early 11th century of the imperial calendar, after having a particularly delicious dinner made by a halfling chef, and because he thought it would be funny. The Counts of Avaland and Stirland thoroughly disagreed, needless to say. <laughs> well, you know, many of us be farmers, and proud farmers, let me tell you. The fact that we're one of the main providers of food for the wider empire makes us proud. But I'd say that the unity of our people stands us apart from the other races. Our picnic gatherings are unparalleled across the lands. The cheese we make here you won't find anywhere else. And the quality beer we drink is simply exquisite. Wouldn't you agree? Rolling green hills and small pockets of oak Elm, beech, and willow make up the bulk of the province. It gradually slopes onto the Greenleaf Hills, where many varieties of tobacco are grown, such as Fogmaker Red, Ava Prime Blend, and the famously strong Fuminator. There are only two forests of note in the Mootland, and they are quite small when compared to ones such as the Drakwald. These forests are the Sleepy Woods and Altar Forest the forest being known as haunted and cursed by the locals, going as far as warranting a hunting party that included a warrior priest of Sigma to attempt to cleanse it. They were never seen again, but one of their horses was later seen exiting the forest with a human arm on its mouth, chewing nervously on it. It was put down shortly thereafter, for the poor horse had gone mad with thirst for the flesh of men and halfling alike. Nobody knows what really happened to the warrior priest and the rest of the party. Moving on, the previously mentioned Greenleaf Hills to the southwest 
is truly a sight to behold. Green as the eye can see, the smell of tobacco filling the air, delicious to the noses of the halflings. Not too many years ago, in a historical sense at least, these lands were considered barren beyond measure, cursed even. Indeed, the Count of Avaland willingly sold it to the halflings shortly after the creation of the new province, muttering, And good riddance! upon signing the contract. It was known as the Duchy of the Fallow Hills, for nothing could grow there. But they were mistaken. Almost out of pure instinct, the halflings knew that those lands would wield them fortunes untold with the planting of a specific type of seedling, tobacco. And so it was that the nearby elect accounts watched them with envy, as the now revealed to be fertile soil, bathed by the River Ava to the southeast, brought in coin from all throughout the Old World. Witch hunters, scholars, and wizards theorize to this day why were those hills barren before, but now produce so much. The most accepted hypothesis is simply that halflings know how to work the soil, and they themselves just claim that they were blessed by Josias the farmer. But a much darker undertone exists there. Although rare, there is crime in the Mutland. Theft isn't really considered crime unless it is a foreigner doing it, in which case the elder simply hands them over to whichever authority they are from. But there are odd cases of a murder here and there, and disappearances, mostly of the big folk that visit the moot, and especially around the previously mentioned Alter Forest, where many enter, but few ever return. And those who do go mad, wailing, banshee-like, until they are mercifully put down. This forest is, in some ways, even more sinister than the Drakwald for none yet know what causes its ailment. Ghosts of a forgotten religion, who enjoy drinking blood, are said to roam the place. But fewer still have made the connection that this so-called forgotten religion might still exist. There are many gods in the pantheons of the old world, but few are less known than the halfling gods. For there are those already mentioned here and one simply known as the Others, of which halflings outside the moot barely even know their names, and seem surprised that any of the big folk know they exist at all. Could one of those gods cause the darkness that takes its seat like a mighty king upon their throne, ruling the dark canopy beneath the oak of divine light in the altar forest? Perhaps. It would certainly not be the first ancient religion found to be evil by modern standards. The blood harvested by the so-called ghosts goes into making the soil of the Greenleaf Hills forever fertile. For when dealing with the gods, there is no such thing as a free blessing, and sacrifices need to be made. But that is only a far-off hypothesis, which very few know about and even fewer believe in. The town of Gipfel, in the heart of the Greenleaf Hills, is the center of tobacco production for all of the Empire, and some dare to say the entire Old World. As a result, each year in the late summer and early fall, traders from the Empire, Kislev, and especially Naln, flock to the settlement in a bid to buy the largest amount they possibly can of the leaf in order to control the biggest share of the market back home, and make some serious coin. But this activity holds dark secrets, for indeed there is an ancient and bizarre cult in it. The previously mentioned disappearances of the big folk are mostly centered here, with the tobacco industry being controlled by some secret hands in the moot. But all in all, the pool of the tobacco market is greater than the sense of self-preservation of many a merchant and entrepreneur, so they always flock to the moot, despite the many cases of strange disappearances that have accumulated over the years. 
Dagobert Heathland is the biggest landlord of the region, and truly the most powerful halfling south of the Ava Reach. Few dare cross him. Old Dag, as he is known, spent several years adventuring through Kislev, and brought back with him a strange faith. All of those who live in Gipfel or depend on it in any way are in the worn down hands of Old Dag, and he makes good use of them. It started as a small gathering of a few halflings in a secluded barn house, but it quickly grew to encompass all of the small town. It is a faith based around fertility and abundance, and the halflings that follow that cult accomplished something remarkable. In no time the crops specifically owned by Old Dag began to grow stronger, to yield double, triple even, the regular yield. Worshipping a strange spirit with no name, ancient to the point it speaks of knowing the first ever human tribes to come into the frozen lands of Kislev. But the price for such abundance is non-negotiable. Once a year, in the autumn equinox, a sentient being must be sacrificed, and their blood must soak the soil of the hills. The sacrificed ones were locals at first, but the cult quickly began to use far-off merchants for these matters. The farther from their homeland, the better. If picking between a Wissenlander merchant or a trade master from Imperial Cathay, the choice is indeed obvious. For being so far from one's half makes it easier to justify their vanishing without a connection to the cult. This happens every single year. Yet no one has been able to prove the connection between Dagobert's cult with the random disappearances. The biggest city of the Mutland is Ichesaden, the capital of the province. It is a seat of the Elder of the Mut, their version of Grand Count, for they believe, and frankly are justified in their belief, that Grand Count is just too posh for their taste. Humans and their obsession with titles. Such a bother. A collection of winding lanes at the banks of the River Aver, the city consists of cottage homes with extensive gardens, mixed somewhat randomly with inns and smithies, shops and taverns of all kinds. It would not take long at all for the eyes of a would-be observer to dry up upon witnessing the many colours of the city, for indeed halflings love their decorations, to the point some think they are either blind or mad, or both. The buildings there are scaled to the locals' physique, but inns and shops often have bigger rooms and doorways for the big folk to make use. In the centre of Ichesaten stands what technically is, but not really, a palace. The seat of the Elder. A two-storey building with a sod roof, and sometimes goats grazing upon it, if the need arises. A large room in the middle of the building with a comfortable and nice-looking chair functions as the Count's throne room. Magnus the Pious, perhaps the most esteemed emperor since Sigmar himself, slept there on his way to the war in Kislev, and he himself said that never before had he had a more comfortable sleep. The centre of government in the Moot, Ichenschatten also holds the land's namesake, the Moot, every three years. Every halfling, mootlander or otherwise, can come to this moot and vote on new laws and policies, handle any crime that couldn't be resolved in the local level, and, of course, elect the new elder of the moot. It is also a big party, with drink and food aplenty. There's also the fact that the previously mentioned Hismi Stoutheart has been re-elected ten times in a row, which is a new record. The Mutland is a very particular province, full of farmers that work the fertile soil to bring bountiful harvests. With customs that may appear weird to some, the halflings live their lives mostly isolated from the outer world, 
For many are the dangers that lurk beyond the rivers and hills of the moot. If you want to learn about a more sinister place than the Mootland, then perhaps Skavenblight is what you're looking for. Skavenblight is said to be the greatest den of the Skaven, with countless tunnels crisscrossing with one another, forming a chaotic network of passages wired with all forms of traps. Follow the link to be taken to that particular place. We thank you for watching, and we will see you on the next one. On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe, and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.